Good morning. We are in the Gospel of John, and we are going to be in chapter 1, verses 19 through 34. And just to orient you briefly uh, to the text, uh, this is, formally speaking, the beginning of the historical account of John's Gospel. So last week we looked at the prologue, that was the lens through which to view the rest of the Gospel. Uh, But verse 19 really is where the story of Jesus, according to John, begins. Furthermore, in our text, there are probably two days. There is day one, and then there is the next day, okay? And so just to orient you a little bit, and then the rest of chapter one will take us through the rest of this week in the life of Jesus. So just so, just so you can understand a little bit how the text is structured. But if you would, stand with me for the reading of God's word. John 1, it's on page 886 in the Pew Bible. John 1 verses 19 through 34, hear what Holy Scripture says. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked them, then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks you can be seated as we pray together and ask for God's illuminating help. Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you so much for all that has taken place already. We are grateful for the time of singing and for the time of prayer and for the time of even brief fellowship amongst us. We have just read your word and now we are going to hear the preaching of your word and we pray and we ask, O God, that you would illuminate our minds that you give us eyes of faith to see things from and in your word that we would not otherwise see. I pray and I ask, O oh God, that you would encourage us, that you would comfort us, that you would convict us, that you would challenge us through the instrumentality of your word this morning. I pray and I ask that you would be with us as a church family. I pray that you'd be opening up blind eyes. I pray that you'd be opening up deaf ears. And I pray that you'd be building us up in our most holy faith. Cause us as a church to be more and more like Jesus. Cause us as a church to be more and more about the glory of God in the name of Jesus. Pray that you would lead us and you would guide us in these few moments that we have together. And we ask this. In Christ's name, amen. 
There was a 20th century conductor by the name of Arturo Toscanini. Toscanini conducted a performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony on one occasion, and apparently it was a brilliant performance. The crowd clapped, they cheered, they whistled, they stamped their feet. I'm assuming it was a standing ovation. The crowd was caught up in the greatness of the performance, and they showed their appreciation at the end of that performance. Now, as the ovation was beginning to die down, Toscanini leaned towards his orchestra, having bowed several times, having acknowledged his orchestra to the audience. As the ovation began to die down, Toscanini leaned towards his orchestra with an earnest whisper. And he said, gentlemen, gentlemen. I remember he's speaking earnestly, in a whisper, and he says, gentlemen, I am nothing. Gentlemen, you are nothing. And in a tone of admiration and adoration, he said, but Beethoven, he is everything, everything, everything. Kent Hughes, the one that I borrowed this illustration from, says, This is the attitude we need towards ourselves and toward the Lord Jesus Christ. I am nothing, you are nothing, but Christ is everything. Now, we find ourselves in this point in the Gospel of John. We're in early days, early stages. In fact, we're at the earliest stage as far as the historical account of the story of Jesus is concerned. The gospel writer John begins where every other gospel writer begins his gospel with the ministry of John the Baptist. You want to keep those names clear. There is John the gospel writer and there is John the Baptist. And every single one of the gospel writers begins with the ministry of John the Baptist, including John the writer of the gospel. John the Baptist played a significant role in the unfolding of the drama of redemption. He is the final prophet of the Old Testament. He is the first prophet of the New Testament. He was tasked with preparing the way for the arrival of the Messiah. So John then is the final messenger before the arrival of the Messiah. That role cannot be repeated. John, therefore, is unique and special in one sense. But in another sense, as the final messenger, I think that John also is presented to us as the messenger par excellence. John is the model messenger for all later messengers. That's how I want to consider this passage this morning. Not to consider John merely as a historical figure that we can sort of marvel at and and, and admire, but rather John as the model messenger for all Christians, of Christian missionaries, of Christian evangelists, of Christian pastors, of Christian ministers. That's how I want to consider the passage this morning. And so look with me to verses 19 through 28 if you're taking notes. It is the humility of the model messenger. The humility of the model messenger. Now, what you will have probably noticed as I read this passage is that it is a dialogue, at least in the first part, between John the Baptist and the delegates sent from the capital. Now, the Jews, in the context of the Gospel of John, often refers to the religious leaders who are situated in Jerusalem and in Judea, who oppose Jesus. It is the Jews who opposed Jesus. It is the Jews who persecuted Jesus. And it is the Jews who placed Jesus upon the cross to die. Now, their character isn't quite developed yet, and so we'll get into that later on in the gospel. But just remember, the Jews are those who are inclined towards opposing Jesus, and they are the religious elite or the religious leaders 
in the capital and in Judea. So it is the Jews then who sent a, dele- sent a delegation from the capital to check this out. John the Baptist was apparently making a big splash in Israel. John had grown up. He had began his ministry in Israel. And evidently, many were flocking to him. He was making uh, the headlines and the nightly news. And many Israelites were going to John to be baptized by John. In fact, in Matthew 3, 7, it says that many, even of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, were going out to see John. And so naturally then, the ruling council, or the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, they were responsible for evaluating and filtering and checking out those who claimed to be a prophet or those who claimed to be a messiah. And so the religious leaders in uh, in Jerusalem send delegates from the capital to this preacher boy, John. So they arrive at John, and John does not beat around the bush. He is emphatic. He is clear, and he is direct. Friends, I am not the Messiah. Well, then are you Elijah? And if you turn to the final pages of the Old Testament to the Italian prophet Malachi, then it says that one day in the future there will be a great and awesome day of the Lord. But right before the great and awesome day of the Lord, the Lord is going to send a prophet-like figure or a prophet figure named Elijah, and he's going to prepare the way for the day of the Lord. Uh, Elijah, are you that guy? Nope. God's people had not heard from God in centuries. There would be many decades and centuries of silence as far as the divine word. And the people know that there was in Deuteronomy 18 a prophet who would come out from amongst the Jewish people who would come and speak on behalf of God to his people as the ultimate and the final prophet. Uh, uh, John, are you that guy? Nope. He was a prophet, but he was not that prophet. And the delegates are beginning to get frustrated imaginably. And he says, well, can't you give us anything We can't go back to our superiors in Jerusalem empty-handed. Who are you? What do you say about yourself? And John says brilliantly and beautifully, friends, I'm just a voice. He quotes Isaiah 43, and it says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. And this connection to the book of Isaiah is important. We took over a year to go through the whole book of Isaiah. Let me just summarize for you in 30 seconds the second half of the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is split into two major sections, the book of judgment in chapters 1 through 39 and the book of salvation in, in chapters 40 through 66. And in the book of salvation, what God says is that he is going to accomplish a new exodus. He's going to bring his people out from exile. He's going to accomplish redemption for them through the suffering servant, and he's going to establish them in the new heavens and the new earth. And the verse that John quotes, the verse that John applies to himself, is chapter 40, verse 3, at the very beginning of the book of salvation. So what John is saying then is that God is going to accomplish a new exodus. God is about to accomplish a great redemption. He is about to work again, and I am just the announcer. That's what John's saying. And then we're introduced to this group called the Pharisees, and and they too have a question. Well, listen, smart aleck. If you're neither the Christ, nor the Elijah, nor the prophet, then why are you baptizing? So their question is not, who are you, but based on what authority are you doing these things? And John doesn't even answer their question. I'm not sure if you noticed that. He doesn't even answer their question. He just points the attention towards Jesus. He says, look, look, I am baptizing with water, but there is a much more significant person who stands in your midst and you do not even recognize him. John doesn't answer their question. He points the attention away from himself and towards the one that he is meant to announce. 
And what you have to understand is that in the ancient world, people's feet got very dirty. Okay? And if you're a mother of young boys, then you might say, well, that happens in the 21st century too. But back then, they didn't have footwear like we do, and they would have walked around everywhere. They wouldn't have had paved surfaces like we do in the way that, in, in the way that we do. Obviously, they had roads and things like that. But people's feet would just get very dirty, very gross, very filthy. And so it was the task then, not of uh, someone within the household, but it was the task of slaves to remove the footwear and to wash the feet. The, the task of removing footwear and washing the feet was a demeaning task, and so it was relegated to slaves. And if you were a rabbi, if you were a teacher, then you would have had disciples who were under you, and you would have treated them somewhat like household servants. They, you would have told them to go get you like a drink or whatever or a sandwich, and they would have gone ahead and done that. They were your servants. They were, they were at your beck and call. But there was one caveat. Disciples never washed the feet and removed the, or I should say, never removed the sandal from their rabbis because that was too demeaning a task. You get then what John is saying, John the Baptist, that is. What he's saying is that the one that I am announcing the one that I am preparing the way for, the one who comes after me but is greater than me, you have to understand that this one that is about to come is so worthy, so majestic, so awesome, and so great that I am not even worthy to stoop down, untie his sandals, and to wash his feet. I think that our society, myself included, has lost the value of humility. This is not what we hold up as greatness. You see, John could have garnered much attention to himself. He was the final prophet in a long succession of prophets in the Old Testament. He was the one who broke the silence as far as divine revelation went, and he was sent as a special envoy, as a special messenger, sent from heaven to the people. He clearly had a following of sorts. People were flocking to him in the nation. He had the privilege of announcing the arrival of the Messiah, and Jesus himself even says that among those born of women, there has never risen one greater than John the Baptist. But here is the thing. John understood that when compared to the one that he announced, he was nothing. John found his identity and significance, ironically, not in who he was, but in who Christ was. I think that there is a sense in which we can see John's I am not statements in contrast to Jesus' I am statements in the Gospel of John. And just as the moon, though, is the brightest object in the night sky, will fade into the background upon the sun's rising, so John understood that though he shined for a time, that with the arrival of the Messiah, with the arrival of the Son of God, he was very happy and very content to fade into the background. I love weddings. I especially love Christian weddings. It's probably one of my favorite parts of being a pastor is to be able to uh, walk with a couple towards their wedding day. I love weddings. The men all suited up, the bridesmaids all wearing matching dresses and having matching bouquets, two families being brought together as a result of this one union the father walking his uh, daughter down the aisle. And one of the most remarkable things to watch at a wedding, obviously, is the beautiful bride in brilliance walking down that aisle. But so is it great to watch the groom as he watches his bride walk down the aisle towards him with pure joy. The bridesmaids are crying. The parents are tearing up. Then there's something of a mini-sermon 
which is the most brilliant of things because it is heartfelt, it is personal, yet it is biblical and theological. And so it brings together both life and theology all together in this 10-minute sermon, which all enjoy, apparently. And the pinnacle of it all is not the kiss, but the exchanging of the vows, where a young man and a young woman make promises to one another to have and to hold from this day forward. For, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish according to God's holy plan till death do us part. And then there is the reception with remarkable food, both in quality and usually in quantity. And then comes the speeches, personal, funny, embarrassing at times. Heartfelt, I love weddings. Now on the wedding day, there should be two people that are prominent in the day's proceedings, the bride and the groom. From the groomsmen's perspective, it is their duty to do all that is necessary to make the day special for the groom. From the bridesmaid's perspective, they should be doing all that is necessary to allow the bride to enjoy her special day, the day that she has been dreaming about since she was a little girl. And the best man and the maid of honor have successfully discharged their duties if they have done just that, if they have done all that was necessary to make the happy couple, or to make the day about the happy couple, if they have done everything within their power to make the day special for them. And it would be awkward. It would be inappropriate. It would be disgraceful for the best man to say at the end of the day and be sad about it, why didn't anyone pay attention to me? It would be awkward and it would be inappropriate for a maid of honor to be upset and say, but that's not how I wanted things to go. With all due respect to all parties, nobody cares about the best man receiving attention. It is of no consequence if the maid of honor's wishes are met or not. What John says concerning himself in the grand drama of redemption And the great marriage of the cosmos is that he is not the groom, but the best man. The wedding day, nay, history and the cosmos is not about him. And John understood that, and John was happy with that. John understood himself to be not the groom, but the best man. And he was completely content and happy with that. So just a few brief questions for you. Are you willing to take second place, to play second fiddle, that Christ can be preeminent in your life? Are you willing to live your life so that Christ can receive all the glory? Are you willing to lay aside your ambitions, plans, and dreams so that Christ's will might be fulfilled in your life? Are you willing to be nothing so that Christ may be all? Or are you more concerned about your kingdom than Christ's kingdom? And are you more concerned about the legacy of your name rather than the legacy of Christ's name? And let me say this. God will be more glorified and you will be more happy if we learn the art of the freedom of self-forgetfulness. If we come to terms with the fact that at the end of the day, we're just not that great or impressive. We're just not that important or significant. But the Lord Jesus Christ is. God will be more glorified and you will be happier if you would learn to forget about yourself and to be caught up in the glory and the grandeur of the Lord Jesus Christ. So John announces the arrival of the Messiah. He prepares the people for the Lord's arrival. He is the messenger par excellence. He is the model messenger. We've considered the humility of the model messenger. Let's now consider the the message of the model messenger. Verses 19 through 34, the message of the model 
messenger. The message of the model messenger, verses 29 through 34. And you might be sitting there like I would be if I was sitting under a sermon like this, and maybe you're feeling convicted, maybe you're feeling discouraged, because like, well, oftentimes, I live my life as if it's about me. My focus is on my wants and my ambitions and my dreams. My, my focus is often on what other people will think about me, not about what other people will think about Christ. And with that, you can feel convicted, you can feel discouraged, and I want to just encourage you that I think that to grasp more deeply the message that John proclaimed will help us to be more humble before God. You see, the reason why John was humble as a messenger was because he had a message which humbled him. And what I want to put on display is not so much your lowliness or your insignificance, but rather the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ and his significance. What you have to understand is not so much that you're really bad and you're really insignificant and you're really small, but rather that when we are compared against the brilliant glory of the Son of God in Jesus Christ, then we really aren't that impressive. And we'll be very, very happy just to attend the wedding and not be the groom. I want to spend the remainder of our time just expanding upon two concepts that John touches upon in this passage. The first of these concepts is the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. Now, in John's day, there would have been many expectations for the coming Messiah. People had all kinds of ideas that would have been floating around in their their minds and in their communities about what it meant for the Messiah to come. One of the prominent ideas was that when the Messiah comes, that Messiah will be a political figure. He will overthrow the the, the the Romans who are oppressing us. He will defeat our enemies, the Messiah will, and the Messiah will place the Jewish people in their rightful place of prominence. We see this kind of thinking even amongst the disciples during Jesus' earthly ministry. You will remember uh, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, the mother of James and John, I think she was starting to understand that, okay, maybe this man named Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, I'm going to set my sons up really well. So he's the Messiah. He's probably going to come and be some sort of a ruler. And so, Jesus, when you establish your kingdom, can you make sure that my sons are your number two and three? Can you make sure that my sons sit at your right hand and at your left? So what we see then is that in the first century, people had all kinds of expectations of what the Messiah would be like and what the Messiah would do. Now, in the 21st century, we have all kinds of expectations of Jesus as well. We have all kinds of gospels that people preach and proclaim and say that it's backed up by the scriptures. For example, we have the social gospel, popularized in the 20th century amongst liberal theologians, where basically the problem with humanity now becomes not our sin, but societal ills. And so what Jesus has come to do then is to help us with things like education, with things like crime, with things like poverty, with things like health and uh, nutrition. Or there is an environmental gospel. I'm not sure if you guys have heard about this Bible, but it's called the Green Bible, put out by Harper Bibles. So in our Bibles, we have the, the, the words of Jesus in red. In this Bible, what we have is Any verse that would talk about earth care, highlighted in green. And so you get the impression then that the core message of the Bible is that we are to be more green. We are to be more environmentally friendly. So there's the social gospel, there's the environmental gospel. and, and And then there are those who value certain aspects of Christianity, but perhaps they've missed some other aspects of it, So what we see here is that we see non-Christian parents sending their kids to Christian schools because they appreciate 
the values. Or maybe there's some of you who are here because you think the world out there is crazy and the church offers an alternative. You haven't fully understood the gospel. You haven't fully understood all that the Bible teaches concerning your sin and your need for a savior, but you like the fact that the church is more conservative and you like the fact that the church is more traditional. On a completely different wavelength, you have the inclusivity gospel. You drive by churches all the time. Love is love. God loves me, wants me to be happy. He approves of whatever I choose to do as long as it's not harming other people. Now, there's some truth, of course, in all of those gospels. But here's the thing. If we make Jesus fit any man-made agenda, the true purpose for why he came into the world gets lost. John makes it abundantly clear that the reason why Jesus came into the world was so that Jesus could be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the background for this idea of the Lamb of God is several texts within the Old Testament. Let me just cite three of those. So one of those you'll remember with Abraham and Isaac, where Abraham was called to offer up his son Isaac on the altar Abraham and Isaac climb up the mountain. Abraham sets up the altar. He ties Isaac to that altar. He is about to slaughter his son. And God says, stop. And God provides a ram to be sacrificed in Isaac's place. Second, we think of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. And the suffering servant who is a messianic figure, we are, he is likened to a lamb who is led to the slaughter. And so what that text teaches then is that the Messiah, as he is about to, to be led into suffering, he will remain silent as a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And then we have the Passover lamb. We mentioned this briefly last week, but we think of the Exodus. And the, and the Passover lamb goes like this. Israel was in captivity for 400 years and 30 years under the thumb of Pharaoh. And on the eve of their departure out of Egypt, God says through Moses and Aaron that I am about to send a devastating plague through the land of Egypt. This is going to be the worst of the plagues that I have sent, sent thus far, but here is what is going to happen. I'm going to strike down all the firstborn in all of the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of the house of Pharaoh to the firstborn of the slave who is in the dungeon. And God says, there is one way of escape. There is one method of salvation, and let me lay it out for you. What you must do, Israelites, is this. Every single one of you in your family unit needs to take a lamb. If your family is too small or too poor, then get together with another family. But every family must be represented in the Passover lamb. You need to kill the lamb. You need to drain that lamb of its blood into a basin. You need to take some hyssop branches and dip the branches into the blood, and you must cover your doorpost with the blood of the lamb. And God says that if you would do this, families of Israel, that when I pass through the land of Egypt to slaughter every firstborn in the land of Egypt, and I see the blood on the doorpost of your house, then I will pass over your house and not allow the destroyer to strike you. And when God sees the blood of Jesus, his wrath is appeased. When God sees the blood of Jesus, his justice is satisfied. And I want to just be very, very clear, because Jesus is used and abused for all kinds of campaigns and causes. Everyone likes Jesus if he will back up their philosophy or their campaign or their cause. But let's let Jesus tell us the purpose for why he came into the world. You see, our religion is called Christianity. 
And at the core of Christianity is a message called the gospel. And at the core of the message called the gospel, the gospel itself, at the core of the Christian life, is a bloody Messiah. It is a bloody Christ who was laid up on the cross to die for the sins of the world. You see, at the core of Christianity is a crucified Savior who dies for the sins of his people, which means this, that all of us have sinned against a holy God and we are deserving of eternal wrath and judgment from this God. But God has done what is necessary for our sins to be forgiven by sending his son into this world by the word being made flesh and that flesh dying on the cross for our sins. He died as our substitute so that we would not have to face the judgment that we deserve. And that is the center message of Christianity. If you miss that, then you have missed everything. It does not matter how morally conservative you are. It does not matter how nice of a person you are. It does not matter how much you reduce your carbon footprint to reduce your emissions or whatever it is. It does not matter how passionately you take up some social cause. At the core of Christianity is a crucified Savior who takes away the sins of the world. And this is why Jesus is precious to genuine Christians. And so let me urge you, my friend, to not move one iota away from this being the core of your heart and of your life, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ crucified in your place and in mine. Because here's what that does. If the gospel is central to our hearts, if the gospel is near and dear to our hearts, it will be harder for us to be prideful. It will be easier for us then to be humble. It, we will recognize and realize, yes, that in the grand scheme of things, I'm really not that significant. In the grand scheme of things, I'm really not that important. And in the grand scheme of things, not only am I not significant, not only am I not important, but I'm actually rather sinful. In the grand scheme of things, my life is broken. In the grand scheme of life, my heart is a mess. And it's partially maybe due to other people's fault, but I am part of the problem as well. I am broken. I am sinful. I am miserable left to myself. But Jesus has done what is necessary for the salvation of my soul. And that should cause us not to be inflated in our ego, but deflated in our ego, that we can be humble before God because of the gospel. So Jesus is the Lamb of God. Second, he is the Spirit-anointed Messiah. I'll be quicker on this one. We've gone back to the Old Testament several times. We'll probably do this throughout the Gospel of John because John, remember, was a good Jewish boy. He knew his Old Testament, and he was picking up on themes in the Old Testament and drawing them through the life of and the ministry, and the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, and he does that here. And in the Old Testament, what we are told is that when the Messiah comes, it, he will be a spirit-anointed person. It says this, Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. And remember that it was John himself John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus, right? He baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, and John heard a voice out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Not only did he hear the voice, but he, heard, he saw the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descend from heaven to earth and remain upon the one that he just baptized. And that's how John knows that this is the Messiah, John knows that this is the Spirit-anointed Messiah because he physically saw and perceived that the Spirit descended from heaven to earth and remained upon this one, Jesus of Nazareth. So very quickly, what does it mean for Jesus to be the Spirit-anointed Messiah? It means this. He is the one who is able to replace a heart of stone with a heart of flesh. He is the one who is able to grant the forgiveness of sins. 
He is the one who is able to dwell in the hearts of God's people. And he is the one who is able to administer the baptism of the Holy Spirit because he is the Spirit-anointed Messiah. To put it very, very simply, he is able to forgive sins and he is able to grant new hearts. I think that will come in handy as we talk about a final application. Now, to be clear, I want... I want to be clear on this. John played a critical and crucial, unrepeatable role in redemptive history. But while John's role was special and unique and unrepeatable, John's message can be repeated. Furthermore, the attitude and the posture with which John proclaimed his message ought to be emulated. And that's how we've sought to look at this text, the humility of the model messenger and the message of the model messenger. Now, I realize that some of you are in overwhelming circumstances. And and I'm particularly thinking of those who are in positions of um, giving counsel and help and care to others. People come to you for help and counsel. The situation is desperate, therefore you are desperate. Or some of you are absolutely terrified of the thought of sharing the gospel, being a witness for Jesus in whatever context that you find yourself. Do I know enough? What if they ask a tough question? What if I mess up? What if they don't listen to me? What if they mock me? To people in both kinds of situations, I want to remind you of two simple truths. First, you are not the light of the world but you know the one who is. You're not the light of the world, but you know the one who is. Second, your job is not to be the solution, but to point to the solution. Listen to me. You are ontologically unable to help someone in and of yourself. You are not the light. You are not able to shine light into another's darkness. You are spiritually incapable to do that work. Do you want to know the only reason why the moon shines at night is because there is a sun that shines brilliantly and the moon simply reflects reflects and refracts that light? You know what we are? Not the sun, but the moon. Can you point people in the right direction? This simplifies our job, the takes the pressure off? Can you point people to the light? People come to you and they share with you all kinds of problems, all kinds of hurts, all kinds of pains, and all you can do, friend, is listen. Maybe you can practically help them. You can point them to the scriptures. You can pray for them, and you can walk alongside of them, but you can't fix their situation. Unless it's like a dishwasher, then dad can fix your situation. (laughs) But I still can fix your situation. But you can say to them, friend, I love you. I'm so sorry that you're going through all that you're going through. Can I pray for you? I can't fix your situation, but I know one who has helped me in these kinds of circumstances. People come up to you and, 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 they, and you're a caring person and so they share with you all kinds of situations, all kinds of things, all kinds of brokenness in their life and you just feel absolutely overwhelmed and helpless. And you can say, friend, I can't fix your world, but I know the one who holds the world in the palm of his hands. And maybe someone's coming up to you and they're, and they're talking to you about all the mess that is in their life. And you know, just because you know the situation, or you know, just even in the things that he or she is sharing, you know that part of the reason for that mess is because of the person that's sitting in front of you. And part of what you might say to them is, friend, I'm so sorry of all the pain and the trial and the suffering that you're going through. But may I suggest that what the Bible says is that there is something called sin inside of all of us. It's a spiritual and moral darkness which even blinds us to our own con- contribution to a problem. And what the Bible says is that if you would turn to Christ and trust in him, then he will forgive you of your sins. He will change your heart and he is able to shine light into the darkness because he is the light of the world. 
I think that sometimes both Christian people and Christian pastors have something called a Messiah complex. They want to fix things. They want to solve things. They want to make everything better when oftentimes we just can't. You're not called. Whether you're an elder in this room, whether you're a visiting pastor, or whether you're a Christian member, you're not called to be the Messiah for your friends and family. I love Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He is the most influential figure in our tradition, the Baptist tradition. He is the prince of preachers. He preached over 600 sermons by the time he was 20. It was not uncommon for him to preach 10 times a week. He would regularly preach to congregate, his congregational size in the auditorium would have been 5,000 people. On one occasion, he addressed a crowd of 23 and a half thousand people. It is estimated that he preached to 10 million people during his lifetime. At the time of his death, 50 million copies of, ser- of his sermons had been sold. By the end of the 19th century, more than 100 million sermons of Spurgeon's had been sold in 23 different languages. A century after his death, there were more works in print by Spurgeon in the English language than any other work, or, or sorry, any other author. Let me conclude with this anecdote from his life, which illustrates, I think, that even Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, was but a voice crying out in the wilderness. In 1857, this is Spurgeon writing, a day or two before preaching at the Crystal Palace, I went to decide where the platform should be fixed and in order to test the acoustic properties of the building. So you're just going to do a sound check, a 19th century sound check. Obviously, they didn't have things like mics and AV team and things like that back then. But he's just going to do a sound check because this building, I think, would have been massive and he just wanted to go and test things out. He cried out in a loud voice, probably from memory, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. In one of the galleries, a workman who knew nothing of what was being done heard the words, and they, and, and they came like a message from heaven to his soul. He was smitten with conviction on account of sin, put down his tools, went home, and there, after a season of spiritual struggling, found peace and life by beholding the Lamb of God. Years after, he told this story to one who visited him on his deathbed. You know, I used to think that this story illustrated the greatness of Spurgeon. It's like, wow, he just like says stuff and then like people get converted. (laughs) Which was true in a sense. God's hand was mightily at work through the Prince of Preachers. But I actually think that this illustrates the very thing that we've been trying to convey. Any one of us, any one of you could have gotten up in that ginormous auditorium of the Crystal Palace that morning and just quoted a Bible verse. And God could have used that in the worker's life to convict him of his sin and draw him to the Savior. And so this story then is actually not a testament to the power of Spurgeon, but to the power of Christ. And so, even Spurgeon... I think one of the greatest mouthpieces in all the history of the church was but a mouthpiece for the Lord. A voice crying out in the wilderness, an errand boy for Jesus, a pointer to the Savior of the world, and a herald to announce the arrival of the King. I think that if that is our call, then we can do that with God's help, to point people to Christ to tell people of the sufficiency not of ourselves but of Christ and to do it with a humble heart because we have come to realize that our lives would be utterly hopeless and we would be utterly lost if it were not for the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. We're thankful for your word and we are thankful for Jesus. 
I just pray that you would be at work in all of our lives in unique and different ways to cause the truths of your word to sink down deep into our hearts. And I pray for all of us, for all of us particularly who are believers in this room, that we would contemplate on what Jesus has done for us, what we could not do for ourselves, and thus we would be humble, O God, before you. And I pray that in our humility and in our brokenness before you, that we would find your comfort, that we would find your solace, and that your Holy Spirit would be at work in us and through us to proclaim this great message to a lost and dying world, the message that Jesus saves, though we cannot. We pray these things in his name. Amen.